uh, I would like to talk to you about the role of teachers in the classrooms that um, have, of course, uh, immigrants. Um, most of you work, as I see in the chat room, with immigrants all over the world, many Hispanics, but also many Asians and <clears throat> so forth. And what I want to do is work with all of you as educators in determining what is it that you can do to create an environment where teachers and students feel safe. And but I, by that I mean we live in a context in which people are discriminated. Uh, our, uh, as uh, Denzel said, the prevailing, prevailing narrative today is discriminatory uh, when people are talking about the impact of immigration in our country. So I want to talk about how to create what I call a culture of respect, mutual respect between teachers and uh, and uh, students, but also among the different groups that we have in our class classes, in our classrooms, different groups of immigrants from different parts of the world who, when coming to the United States, they do have a commonality that we need to find, but also have oftentimes a mistrust of each other. So one activity that I like to do is what I call the respect activity. And the respect activity is something that I will invite you to do in your classrooms early on uh, every year. I believe that it can set rules of engagement in the classroom, a, a baseline for people to feel that you are building a safe environment where they can talk about different social issues, about issues affecting them in their communities, and uh, feel safe that they will not be judged or attacked. So what <clears throat> I would like to do is ask you to go into your uh, chat rooms, all the adult educators into one chat room. Um, I'm not sure which one you are selecting, um, but all of the adult educators into one chat room and then the K through five in another and the six through 12 in another one. So um, if you will, in those rooms, all of the adult educators will please discuss for a few minutes the question, what is respect? The uh, K through five, please discuss the question, what is tolerance? And the six through 12, discuss the question, what is inclusion? And let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the activity. What I want is for you to take time to come up with one uh, definition of respect, of tolerance, or of inclusion one definition that you as a group can live with. That is that you agree that that is your group's uh, understanding of the concept of respect. The same thing for the concepts <clears throat> of tolerance, excuse me, of tolerance and of inclusion. All right, so let's return to the webinar now. And with the moderators, post your definitions in the chat box. The adult educators said, uh, recognize, uh, respect means recognizing and honoring one another's humanity and treating one another with kindness and dignity, even if we disagree. I like that. I will also pose a couple of questions. What do we have the other ones? That was the definition of um, respect. What about the definition of tolerance? I picked in and I saw some uh, discussion of how unpleasant the word tolerance can be for some people. What is your definition? Claire, okay. Sarah, I'm moderating the other chats. Would you mind uh, posting what your definitions were from your chat groups?
while we wait, I would ask those of you in the adult group that uh, was uh, defining respect to expand a little bit that definition when you say treating each other, uh, one another with kindness, and I would say also treating each other's opinions, and that is important, uh, and contributions in the classroom with uh, kindness, if kindness is the right word. So let's see, inclusion is a community of engagement created by educators, students, parents, community stakeholders to incorporate all learners, regardless of their language proficiency, ethnicity, disability, in order to provide them with equitable education that best meets, well, very nice, uh, very complete um, definition. Do we have another one? A tolerance is a transformation and or result of acceptance to inclusion. Moving from accepting to inclusion, okay. Adjustment free zone where everybody can be themselves and free to share their differences with others. Okay, great. So now we have three concepts, respect, tolerance and inclusion. <clears throat> and these are not final by any means. Uh, and I don't have, and I will never share with you my personal definition of respect or tolerance or inclusion. If this was my classroom, what I would have done is, with more time, is engage now all three groups uh, and ask those of you who uh, define tolerance to maybe um, critique your uh, the definitions of respect and inclusion that your colleagues have come up with. And those of you who uh, define respect, look at inclusion and tolerance and so on. The idea being that by the time that you go run robbing and everybody has had an opportunity to uh, look at these three concepts, you as a teacher come up with, and you do not give your own definition. You ask questions as I, as I did in the chat rooms, uh, asking people to consider uh, one angle or another, but you do not give them your, um, your definition. At the end, what I like to do is all of these uh, common uh, um, definitions are written in a card that if you can, you um, laminate and they are the classrooms early on, the classrooms definitions of respect, of tolerance, of inclusion. You put them on the wall. If you don't have your own classroom, carry them with you in your briefcase. And every afternoon or every morning when you come to class, put them in a place where it's visible. From that point on, those three uh, common definitions that they have agreed on become the rules of your classroom. And every time that you hear a language that is disrespectful, language or actions that are not um, uh, tolerant or are not inclusive, you point at those words. You point at the cards and say, look at those cards. Is that comment, the comment that you just made, is it respectful? Is it tolerant? Is it inclusive? Ask the questions of the students, showing, modeling for them how uh, you, when you hear something that is intolerant, you interrupt it. When you see something that is disrespectful, whether it's behavior or speech, you interrupt it right there and then. After a few days modeling it, you will see that your own students will start to realize when they hear something that is not respectful, those are their own rules. Those are their own words. And it actually works really well. <clears throat> so I really invite you to do it. Um, so I said that this is creating the classroom rules and that you as a teacher need to model the uh, idea of disrupting the oppression, disrupting the uh, disrespectful language or behavior. But how are we going to do that? How do we bring ourselves to be ready to do this um, interruption? 
who are we and how much do we know about ourselves in the context of our students? I think that we need to start by identifying the different dimensions of diversity, our own diversity as well as our diversity, our students' diversity. I'm showing you here a chart that shows a number of dimensions of diversity, uh, ethnicity, sexual identity, age, class, race, religion, you can read them all, gender, identity or expression, ability, and you can come up with many more. And the idea is that we are all intersections of all of these things. Um, this chart is a little bit complicated in that it's difficult to see where we are, uh, where we find ourselves in this ongoing uh, interlocking sets, set of circles. But our identity, each of us, is made up of an, a number of dimensions and over time these dimensions change, some take more impact or more importance, a larger piece of our identity is made out of one of them at one particular time, say if we have uh, an accident or an illness and we become disabled, our disability may be a bigger part of our identity for a while until we learn to restructure our behavior. There is another way of looking at the identity. It's called the identity mosaic. And uh, you have there, and I, I'll show you later the resources, where the resources come. The idea is that if, this is simpler to, to visualize. The idea is that if we are a, number of components, our identity is made up of a number of components, then if we look at ourselves as a pie of sorts, as a pizza, what are the important components and how much of this pie is made up uh, out of uh, our different <clears throat> identities? Uh, I'm going to show you next one rough one that I made uh, for myself. But to give you an idea of what I want you to take a moment and do, uh, grab a pencil and a piece of paper, uh, maybe at home, you don't need to share it with us, but write a circle just as the one that you are seeing in the screen and do something like this. And consider yourself in terms of your, the different components of your identity and consider whether or not you are advantaged by that particular component of your identity or you are targeted. And targeted is another way of saying targeted is you are discriminated because of that. Uh, advantage, you can also look at being privileged. And I'm showing you here in my own terms which ones are the ones that I consider important for my own identity. My ethnicity is important, but you see that it's perhaps not a major role, it doesn't play a major role in my identity, whereas the fact that I am a father and a husband plays a major role. Education and my profession play a major role, and if you consider that my profession is education, then you can see that perhaps that composite of education and profession for me is very important. Whereas at this point in my life, the fact that I am physically and mentally able does not impact me too much, uh, so I don't think about that much. Uh, or my sexual orientation, seen as uh, being a father and a husband is an important one for me. And finally, my religion plays a very important role, and I put it on the half of the identity mosaic next to education and profession because uh, my religion plays a very important uh, role also in my work on, uh, uh, on these issues of social justice. So what do I do? I consider myself advantaged in a heteronormativity, in a heteronormative society that puts a plus, so to speak, to um, being a male, Have you been, have I been in silent all this time? Uh, 
We can hear you loud and clear, Federico. Okay, because suddenly I, I got a message from my computer saying that now I am unmuted. But oh, you have been everything is fine. Okay, good. It scared me for a moment. So anyway, <clears throat> I am uh, I am Hispanic, but my ethnicity is not a major role. It doesn't play a major role in my identity. Uh, I am. A Christian, and in this country, Christians are advantaged over uh, members of other religions. I am highly educated, and education is also privileged over uh, people who are not educated in our society. Um, interestingly enough, speaking of my uh, ethnicity, I consider myself white, even though I am Hispanic. And being white in this country is also advantaged. So maybe my language at one point of in time when I first moved to the United States, the fact that my language was not uh, English was a disadvantage, and I may have been discriminated uh, because of that at a number of points. Uh, so I would like you to take time, a moment, to look at yourselves in this light and decide whether or not you feel yourself to be privileged, advantaged, or targeted slash discriminated because of the components of your own identity. Let's take just three minutes. It's a gut reaction. It's just to get you to think about whether or not um, you have ever been considered or consider yourself to be privileged. Take a couple of minutes. I see a comment uh, in the chat room that the uh, majority, the vast majority of immigrants, says Denzel, uh, to the United States are Christian as well. And yes, I know that it's interesting that uh, our national narrative is focusing so strongly on uh, particularly Muslim immigrants, uh, and they are certainly discriminated. And many of the immigrants from Asia are not uh, Christian. Of summer, of course. Well, if you, uh, it, it would be nice to see on the chat room quickly how many of you have ever considered yourselves to be privileged, uh, at least in the context of your educational uh, environment. So say something like, yes, if you consider yourself privileged, uh, or me. No, I'm not privileged. Yes, yes, I am privileged, yes. Well, many of you have. Interesting. Okay. That gives me an idea. Uh, yes, because I'm able-bodied. Yes, I consider myself privileged. No, yes. Okay, good. I think that's enough. Gender education ability, those are my privileged traits. Okay, my P traits. So yes, uh, many teachers, and it's very important uh, that we do this, many teachers have never considered whether or not they were privileged until you consider your identity in light of your student's identity and your student's uh, condition. So, uh, <clears throat> And I appreciate Patrick's uh, comment. I have had privilege for sure. This decontracting this is so important. It is very difficult for any of us to consider for the first time, uh, unless you have had time to consider it, as many of you have, uh, whether or not we are privileged. And we tend to believe that we are not privileged. Uh, we tend to believe that everything that is not going our way is uh, because of something 
uh, societal. Uh, we are not as rich as we want to be. We are not as respected as we want to be or as successful. And we do um, think that it's because we are disadvantaged or not privileged. But the truth is that when you consider our students in that light, uh, <clears throat> then you see how um, privileged we are. So now consider your students and maybe write answers to these questions again in the chat room. Consider your students in light of the identity mosaic. What components of their identity make them targets of anti-immigrant sentiments? And again, going back to the prevailing narrative that says that uh, immigrants are a problem and uh, so forth. In what ways are they indiscriminated? And uh, finally, in what ways, if any, are they advantaged? So consider that and write in the chat room, but now write in terms of your, um, your students. Some are undocumented, that would make them targeted. Children of migrant farm work are in the farm workers, are definitely a target. <coughs> Some students are not targeted at all. Some speak another language because of religion, because of accent religious dress, and accompanied minors, and so forth. So you see a number of ways in that uh, they are uh, discriminated uh, or targeted while we are advantaged. So let's move on and quickly note that bullying of ethnic, religious, and minorities Linguistic minorities is in the increase in the United States. Sexism and genderism continues being a presence in our society. Even today, women make 79 cents to a man's dollar, uh, in improvement over the past when it was only 72 cents just 20 years ago, but still well behind. Bullying, it continues to happen both in schools and in the workplace. And it also happens when media, particularly certain media, attacks your identity group. So we need to be ready to help our students, understanding that they are discriminated, understanding that they may feel discriminated, and that they are in a contextual narrative that blames them for the problems in the economy, blames them for schools not having enough resources, and so forth. What is it that we can do in our classrooms? Should we bring these issues into our classroom? Should they be part of our uh, curriculum? If you will, please uh, say yes, no, definitely, yes, yes. I will tell you a story, a quick story. Not too long ago, I was, claro, definitely, of course. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to see all this. Uh, not too many years ago, I was participating on an online discussion about bringing these issues up in the classroom. And it lasted for about two months, a heated, heated discussion of whether we needed to incorporate critical thinking around issues of social uh, justice in the classroom. And some people saying, absolutely no, never. In fact, we were told that uh, bringing uh, these issues in the classroom, to the classroom, showed our leftist agenda. Teaching, someone even said that teaching um, critical thinking in the classroom was equal to being a socialist. Um, which was absurd, completely absurd. So someone intervened one, at one point and said, it's not that I want to bring these issues to the classroom, is that those issues are brought in the classroom by our students. Those are the issues that surround us in our community. So we cannot ignore issues of social justice, issues of discrimination, 
in the classroom. We must teach with this lens in mind. And something that we need to do is uh, decide how uh, these issues affect our professional development as practitioners and what steps we take uh, <clears throat> to deal with those social issues. So if we're going to teach with this lens, we need to, first of all, be aware of our own social identities, who we are in the classroom. We need to confront our own prejudices and we don't need to kid ourselves. All of us have prejudices at one level or another. Um, there is an activity that I wish we could have the time to do called the uh, social distance scale that will show you that at one point or another, your prejudice will show. What matters is to determine where will it show and to educate yourself so that any prejudice that you have does not show, show in the context of your uh, work with students. We need to be uh, willing to respond to biased comments in the classroom and to be open to some degree of personal disclosure uh, so that we use our own experience as an example and build <clears throat> the trust with our students. And if we are going to do this, we need to deal with the emotional intensity and the fear of losing control. It is very difficult to control class when we are uh, sharing stories of uh, uh, personal pain and fear. So teacher allies, and this comes again from the book that I'm using as a resource, take responsibility for learning about their own target group, heritage, culture, and experience, and how oppression works in everyday life. And allies listen to and respect the perspectives and experiences of target group members. So this is where the question about what is respect comes to play. It's very important if you're going to learn to respect the perspectives of other groups uh, to have re, uh, resolve the issue of what really respect means in your classroom. Um, we need to acknowledge that some of the privileges that we work with and we have uh, are unearned and we need to work to eliminate or change privileges into rights that targeted group members can also enjoy and by targeted group members our immigrant students are oftentimes members of targeted groups they are willing to take risk risks that is teacher allies try new behaviors and act in spite of their own fear and resistance If we are going to succeed in this classroom, in the classroom as teacher allies, allies of minorities, we need to look at privilege and we need to look at uh, discrimination. We need to know when and where we are privileged vis-a-vis -vis our students. And of course, understand that uh, privilege is also positional and uh, contextual. So we need to decide what are the characteristics of that make up an ally teacher. Uh, we need to come up with an action continuum that is where we are going to start and where we want to be in maybe a year from now and put together a plan. Uh, again, the resource of teaching uh, for diversity and social justice book that I use as a resource has a very good um, uh, handout on this that I could make uh, available uh, to anyone who sends me an email. Okay, so I would like to finish with a comment. Um, he just died a few days ago, but I have used this a quotation from the trilogy Night of Elie Wiesel. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men and women are persecuted because of race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. 
And that universe is our classroom. That is where we must take sides and we must decide when we interrupt oppression, when we stand on the side of respect and inclusion, and when we say enough is enough and create a, com a community of respect, a culture of respect for each other. <clears throat> the last two slides are the two books that I really highly recommend. Uh, Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice. Most of the activities that I spoke about today come from that particular book. And the companion book that came out a few years later are Readings for Diversity and Social Justice. Uh, I highly, highly recommend them. And uh, finally, I leave you with a few resources that can help your work on becoming allies of your students in minority groups. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry that my voice is not what it's normally. Thank you, Denzel. That's all right. Federico, before you, want, you go, I wanted to just ask one question. So in your experience of doing this diversity training, have you received uh, feedback from the people you've trained as to what they've implemented and what has worked? Maybe you can give one example. Yes, one thing that I have heard many teachers, particularly in Texas where I work, uh, say is that um, the activity of defining those three concepts has worked very, very well. Now, I will say that I also received some feedback that people had a lot of trouble with the word tolerance. So if you don't want to discuss the word tolerance, don't do it. Just define respect. If you have to choose just one, define the word respect with your students. And uh, that should be the one common element in your classroom, uh, your, your definition of respect. Also, what I have heard is from the last activity that I suggest you do, and again, I can give you the resources, is uh, consider yourself in light of privilege. If you have not read, and it's not here, if you have not started by reading your uh, famous um, Peggy McIntosh's White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, that is a short 30-some pages article. Now it's almost 30 years old, but it is critical to start reading that if people have not have the time to look at uh, privilege. What Once you have done that, I have received feedback from teachers uh, here in Texas and in other states where I have trained, Arkansas, for example, um, and Florida, that have told me that the activities of putting together a action plan to become an ally of minorities, that works really well. Any other questions? No, I think we want to... Um... Well, first of all, we want to thank you for that great discussion. By the way, the white privilege and uh, unpacking um, the Peggy McIntosh resources, we will upload those to the resources section of uh, the workshop website that everyone will have access to. Uh, we've actually used those in this workshop before, and they're great. Very, very reflective, very introspective, puts a lot of things in perspective. Uh, so thank you very much, Federico. Thank you so much. One more thing is if when you read the white privilege, change the word white or the word race for class and see if you are also not privileged because of class. Oftentimes, even if you're not white, class can play the same type of privileging uh, role that uh, race does in our country. So I encourage you to read it and change the word race for class oftentimes. Thank you very much.